All right, um, death in the pot. Uh, Elisha comes to Gilgal here where there's a school of the prophets. Uh, the school of the prophets are men that are serious about serving the Lord. And so what they do is they come out from the mainstream culture. Uh, the mainstream culture at the time in Israel, if you study the kings and what was going on, is uh, there was a lot of idolatry. There was a lot of Baal worship. There was a lot of things that were going on that were, that were wrong with the golden calves and all the things that were going on there. And yet, God saw fit to, to have these pocket of people uh, that said, you know, we don't want any part of that. We want to serve the Lord. And so they separated themselves. And God brought Elisha by periodically, and he would preach to them and uh, fellowship with them. He would train them uh, for the ministry to serve the Lord, you know? And, and so what would that represent today is that's like a local church, you know? Uh, the school of the prophets is like you and I. We have recognized that there's some things going on in our culture and the world that are not right. And, and even though we're in the world, uh, we've been born again and we're not of the world. Uh, we want to serve God and we want to separate ourselves uh, to serve the Lord. And so that's what that was like. And, and, and during this time, uh, it says that in the verse, verse, there was a dearth in the land. Uh, there was a famine, okay? And it was because the people of Israel, God's people and the king, they were joined to idols. Uh, there was a lot of idolatry in the land, and, and so God brought judgment on the land, you know? And uh, you, you recognize that when war and, and famine and pestilences, they, they come upon a, 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 a land. You know what that is? That, that's God's judgment on that land, you know? And um, there's, there, you reap what you sow, you know? And, and that's a spiritual law. And it works with nations as well as individuals. And so... There's this famine in the land. Uh, the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 13, uh, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out my hand upon it and will break the staff of bread thereof and will send famine upon it and will cut off man and beast from it. Why? Because the land sinned against me. There's another passage in Deuteronomy where he gives the blessings and cursings. And he said, if you serve me, this will happen. Uh, talking to his people. And if you don't serve me, then, then the heaven's going to be brass to you. And the earth is going to be iron. You're going to try to put your shovel in and nothing's going to happen because it's so hard because it's so dry. Um, so all this is going on, okay? And yet here's this group of people that God is feeding. Think about all the the starving. Uh, the, it was bad. We, we talked about that already. It was so bad during this eight-year famine that a, a donkey's head was going for 80 pieces of silver. Jesus was only portrayed for 30. Uh, a cab of dung. They were, they were, people were boiling their children and eating them. I'm not trying to be graphic, but that's how bad this famine was. And out there it was really bad and, and here's this group of people that God is providing for. And, and He's been good to. You know? You read later on with the, in this passage that these guys bring this 20 loaves of bread and God miraculously feeds them. Uh, that's kind of setting the stage for the Lord's uh, feeding of the 5,000. This miracle was the feeding of the hundred. And God was miraculously uh, taking care of them uh, during this time. And you know, the Bible is full of examples of God's care for His people. Um, we, we learn from the Bible that the only reliable thing is God. The only thing we can count on when things are falling apart is the Lord. And the Bible is so full of examples of God just miraculously and lovingly providing for His people in the worst circumstances. I think about Hagar. You know, she's 
out there, there's no water. She throws her kid under the shrub to die, and the angel of the Lord comes and says, look, there's, there's some stuff over here. And God is just, he's good, isn't he? He's good to us. And uh, I want you to, to think about those people there. Um, God's taking care of them. And uh, he tells his servant Gehazi, uh, after the sermon, to set on the great pot. You know, we're going we're to have some food. And so, you know what they must have felt like? Man, we are just God's spoiled children. You know? I mean, we've just heard from Elisha, God's mouthpiece on earth. And now all this famine's going on, and God has provided for us a pot of stew. And we're about to eat. Have you ever felt that way, that you're just like one of God's spoiled children, and God's just been so good to you? You know, I was speaking to a, uh, you know, you, maybe you're talking to one of your church members about the glories of God and the Bible and how good He is, and, and you have these moments, you know? Maybe it's when you're spending time with your child. Maybe it's when you're catching a fish. You know, I do that. I get that fish, and I'm like, man, God is so good. You know, I can't believe all this in a fish, too. You know, God allowed me to, he, to have this moment. Maybe you're in an airplane, and, and you're thinking, I am sitting in a chair going through the sky at 500 miles an hour. Like, I, God is just good to us. Would you not agree? And um, you've had these moments, and it, but here's the problem, is they, they took the good things that God gave them and ruined it. They, they took this provision that God had given for them, miraculously in this terrible time, and they poisoned it. They ruined it. That which was good was made death unto them. And you know what? We're in a famine as well. The Bible says in Amos 8.11 that the days come, saith the Lord, I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread. We're not there yet. Maybe we have a famine of formula. Um, but he said it's not a famine of, of bread or thirst for water but of hearing the words of the Lord. And it says in verse 12, they shall wander from sea to sea, from the north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. God said there, there's going to be a famine where it's going to be difficult to find a place like these guys had where they're, they're protected and Elisha's coming and speaking to them and they're, they're hearing the words of God. And, and, you know, it, we, there's a famine in our land. It's, it's difficult, depending on your location, to find a, a good church where the Word of God is being proclaimed and, and people are serious about that and serving God. And, and we live in a city, and there might be access to a lot of good churches in our city, uh, but if you're on the north slope of Alaska, there's not much there, Okay. Uh, if you're in some towns and places in our country, in, in the world, imagine you're in Afghanistan today and you get born again and you get saved. There, there's a famine there and there's nowhere to go to get this that you have today. They don't have, it's not an option, okay? And, and what I'm trying to say here is there's a famine in this world uh, for hearing the words of God and, and, and all the things that are going on and God has been good to us, and He's given us this, what we have here this morning. And that's God. And that's His loving, merciful care for us. And, um, you know, we need to take it seriously. And we need to appreciate uh, what God has for us. Um, we're feasting in a time of famine. And even in your, our city, I want you to think about all the uh, things that happened last night. And maybe you've been there before where you woke up 
on a Sunday morning and you were hung over and you were trying to clean up the dishes and the glass from a fight the night before. Uh, there, there's people uh, this morning that are waking up to family members that are gone because they took their life in our city, you know? Uh, there's all kinds of trouble and, and, and things and terrible things that are happening this morning. And God has us protected here this morning and we're feasting on His Word. And there's nothing um, like being hungry and going and getting some Thai food or whatever food you like, you know? It just, just being really hungry and, and going and, and it's good and there's nothing like that. And even in a greater sense, there's nothing like being spiritually famished and walking in and hearing the Word of God with somebody that, that knows God and they have an anointing on them and, and you hear the preaching and it just it refreshes your soul. I've had that happen many times where I went in there and, and I just come out and I'm so refreshed. And I, I'm so thankful. And, and the world was such a famine and I was so hungry. And, and I went in and, and God ministered to me. And I know you've had that happen, and, and we want to protect that, don't we? But you know what? You know what we can do? Uh, we can poison it just as well. I want you to think about this. That, that pot had life in it. You, when you're starving and in a famine, food is life. You know that? Uh, there's life in it. And uh, the Bible says, uh, you know, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. One of the songs we sang talked about that this morning, you know. We, we have this treasure in, in earthen vessels. We, we have, our life is, is, is in the vessel of our flesh. The Lord's there, we're there, right? Uh, we're, we're like a, uh, a vessel, like a pot, if you will, with, with life in it. And, uh, you know, the church can be like this as well. It's a, this was a great pot. It was a community thing, and, and they were fellowshipping together like a church or a family. And, and you know what they did? They, they took something good and made it into something lethal. And we can do the same thing. You can do the same thing with your life, with your family, with the church. And so we're going to look at how they, they messed it up in hopes that we can say, we're not going to do that. We're not, I'm not going to do that in my life. You know, I'm not going to do that in my family's life, and, and I'm not, I don't want to see that happen uh, here at this place this morning either. I don't want to ruin and, and poison and make lethal that which God has designed for life. So how did they mess it up? Well, I think, number one, uh, by going rogue. And so... Look at verse 38, and Elisha came to Gilgal, and there was a dearth in the land, and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said unto his servant, set on the great pot and seethe pottage for the sons of the prophets. And then look at verse 39, and one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered thereof wild gourds in his lap full and came and shred them into the pot of the pottage, for they knew them not. So they're done with their meeting, and Elisha tells his servant, whose name is Gehazi, uh, to set on the great pot and to seethe pottage. That means to boil it or simmer it. And, and Gehazi was the only one he told to do that. That was his job. Uh, his job was to cook this for the sons of the prophets, and he didn't tell anyone else. And someone took it upon themselves to improve upon Elisha's instructions. Uh, they took it upon themselves uh, to go beyond what Elisha had said and, and just do what he thought was best instead of what God told him to do and, and interfere in an area that he had no business interfering. And by doing that, he messed everything up. And you know, we can do the same thing. God gave us this life, and, and he gave us instructions with it. 
And He gave us what to do with this life. And it's very easy to forget that we are the servants of God, and and we are supposed to take our direction from Him. We are supposed to get permission from Him and, and guidance from Him, more than even permission, from where He wants us to go and what He wants us to do. And you know what, well, many times we, we don't do that. We say to God, this is my plan, would you please approve it? Now, this is what I'm going to do, God, would you please bless it? And you know what God says many times, I never told you to do that. I never, I never told you to do those things. This, this was your idea. And you know, sometimes uh, we don't, it's, it's very difficult to know the specific will of God. Like, what is it He wants you to do this morning for Him? What is your job, uh, your ministry, what God called you to do uh, to be a, a blessing as He called you to do the body of Christ? Sometimes that's difficult to find out. And uh, you know what we should do? We should do the general will of God, the things that are written in the Bible that we already know we should do. And in doing those things, many times God will give you the specific thing to do. But where we get in trouble is we say, i, I got to do something and I'm just going to do this. And I'm going to make this up. And, and people get into so much trouble doing that. They, they get ahead of God and they go rogue and they do things God uh, never, never told them and never instructed them to do. And they're not equipped to do it because God didn't instruct them to do it. And, and they mess things up, and um, we got to remember that. And as a church, we can do that too. Not only as individuals, we can do that, you know, as uh, in our family. We can say, you know, God gave me these kids, and, and I'm just going to do what I want to do with them, instead of what he told me to, you know? In your marriage, and, and in every area of your life, you can do that, but as a church, we can do it too. You know, the Bible uh, gave us our mission. It says... Um, Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Um, Teaching them to observe whatsoever things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, uh, even unto the end of the world. And in another passage that mirrors this passage, it says you preach the gospel to every creature, right? And, and so you know what God has, has called us to do is preach the gospel to people, um, baptize them, and, and teach them to serve the Lord and the things that Jesus commanded. And um, that's our mission. And so what I done and what we've done is we've developed our church mission off of that and we say you know the mission of Wesatch Avenue Baptist Church is to glorify the Lord you know he created all things for his glory and we do that by seeking the lost uh, teaching the found and inspiring Christians to serve the Lord and and get involved in that that mission right And, and God God gave us that that's from the Word of God, and it is not the business of the church uh, to get candidates elected. You know? It's not the business of the church to uh, take matters uh, to Congress. You you don't see the the people in the Bible, you know, going on protesting before the the Senate and the pro-council and and complaining about the policies against the church, right? Right? And now I'm not saying that you should not vote. Uh, I vote, and I think that's a responsible thing to do. But what I'm saying is the mission of the church is not a political message. It's for the Lord. It's for the gospel. Uh, you know, the mission of the church is not to uh, feed the hungry, you know, and clothe the, you know, I know the Lord said you, you, you saw me hungry and you feed them and we do things like that. But the mission of the church is not to start a humanitarian organization. You know, it's, it's to be connected with the gospel. And um, so many times that, that's why we don't do a lot of things because that's not what God has called us to do. And before we do that, we need to get really good at doing what he told us to do. Before we take on anything new, we need to do uh, the main thing that God has called us to do. 
And, um, you know, they, the soup had everything that was needed there. And, and this guy came up with his own agenda, and so he took it on himself to change the soup. And, and by doing his own thing, he ruined the soup. And I tell people, you know, we, we already have a mission, we have a direction, we're going. And many times people come in and they say, you know, we, you should do this. And I'm going to start this and you should support me doing this. And I say, you know, God's already given us a direction we're going. And my job and your job is to go in the direction and support that where God's called us to do. We don't need to come up with something new. And they come in and they know what the, you know, pastor should preach and what ministries the church should support. And, and um, you know, I, I kind of say to them, you know, if you want that, uh, then maybe you should go find that and get behind that. Because there's plenty of other people that do that. But that's not what God called us to do. And when we do that, we, we mess it up. Um, and I'm not saying that it's bad uh, to have ideas to make things better. That's not bad. But you, you should ask Elisha about it. You should ask God about it, right? And maybe if he would have asked Elisha about it, he would say, you know, that's good. We could use some of that. But when you're going out there, there there's something unique about our part of the land. At Gilgal here, there, there's a, a poisonous plant that grows here that looks just like the good plant in the place you're, you're from. And so, make sure that you don't get that. Because even though it looks like that, it's not that, it's, it's poison. And, and, and that's unique to our situation, and, and you need to be aware of that. But, but we could use some of this, and this is good. But he didn't do that. He just went out on his own, and he went rogue, and he, he made things up. And... Um, We ought not to do that. We'll, we'll ruin it. We'll ruin the good thing God has for us. Uh, we'll ruin the fellowship in the midst of the famine. There's a big blessing to be had in knowing what God wants you to do and doing it. And uh, not just making it up. You know, Eve, Eve went rogue. Abel went rogue and he said, I'm going to give God these vegetables. This is going to be my offering. We're, we're going to do away with the tradition that the Lord has given us with the coats of skin and, and sacrificing these animals. And I'm going to come up with my own thing because this is better. It, 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 it's more environmentally friendly. and I, I, I doubt he said that. But, you know, but he came up with his own thing, didn't he? I remember when Moses went to Pharaoh, God said, I want you to tell Pharaoh this. And Moses said, okay, I'll tell him this, but I'm not going to tell him this. I'm not going to tell him that he's going to lose his son. I'm just going to tell him this part. And I don't know if it would have been different or not, but I just know what God told Moses to say to him, and he didn't do it. And, um, you know, Saul, God said, go take care of this situation and, and, and kill Agag and kill everything and don't do this. And and you know what Saul did? He went out on his own and he said, I'm going to keep Agag and I'm going to spare these things. And he ruined the good thing God had for him. That was the thing that ruined it. That was the thing that messed it up. And, you know, I, I'm not judging this man. I, I want you to know that. And I want you to know that I, all of us, are very susceptible to this kind of behavior. Uh, recently, we had a, a situation in our church where, you know, there was a, a group of people, this Spanish ministry, and they had a preacher, and they didn't have a building, and, and we had a ministry, and so the idea came up, well, why don't we just put these things together and, you know, praise God and go on, and we do more together. And, and I thought, that sounds good. That sounds good. That makes sense. We'll, we'll do that. But then there was something. And so then I got a hold of God and I said, Lord, I, I don't know what this is. And, and you know, 
Come to find out, God never told me to do that. And that was not of God. And he showed me in a very specific ways why it was not of God. Um, but you, you know what would have happened? I would have messed the soup up. Okay, And I'm very prone to that. I think some of us are more prone than other people. You know? This, this just, let's just do this. Let's just make sense. But what I want to say is, is in, in your life, if you operate that way, you're going to mess it up. In your family, if you operate that way, you're going to mess it up. These instructions, they have to come from God. It, it has to be God that tells you to do it. So, number two, uh, we mess things up when experience is more important than content. When experience is more important than content. You know, what, what did he go out there to gather uh, in verse 39? And, and why did he go out there to gather these herbs? Do, do you know? He wanted to spice things up. Uh, he wanted to, um, I, I don't know what herbs, I should have looked that up, that would have been interesting. It's too late now, but I, I don't know what they were. Was it coriander? Or, I, I don't know, but y you know what? He looked at that soup, and, and he said, this is going to be pretty boring. Uh, this is, uh, you know, I don't want to eat this same boring soup. I, I want to do something to make it more fun and, and more exciting. Now, I'll say this, that there's nothing wrong with spices. I love spices, and the spicier, the better. But, but the problem was that the experience of eating the soup was more important to him than the soup itself. The, the spices were more important than the sustenance, and uh, how it went down was more important to him than what happened after it went down. What tasted good was more important than what was healthy. And it didn't matter that there was a famine going on and it was just a blessing to be able to eat. He was willing to risk all of that, not only for himself, but everyone else he was willing to risk it just for some fun and a, a different experience. And he took risks he shouldn't have taken and he added things he should not have added because he cared more about the initial experience than the lasting consequences. And because of that, what was good was made into something that was lethal. And many of us have ruined what God has given us because we've been more focused on the experience than the content. And um, how many people have sacrificed the good, blessed things that God designed for marriage on the altar of lust? And... Um, you know, that thing that God designed to happen in marriage is good. It's a blessing. And it's, um, it, it's sanctified of God. And it says the marriage bed is undefiled. You know? And, and it's, a, it's a good thing before God. And, and you know what people do is they, they ruin it. Because they want the experience. And, and they're more concerned with the experience than the lasting consequences so that which is good is made evil to them you know he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body and there's no other sin that defiles every part of you drunk doesn't do that you know but this gets on you in ways that that are very hard to heal from and um you know there there's people that are so concerned with the experience that sometimes they put apart that which is good. You know, sometimes we wake up in the morning and, and I don't know, you read your Bible and sometimes you know what people do? They say, uh, I'm, I'm not going to do this because it's not exciting. And so they put that aside and they pick up their phone or something that will give them a different kind of experience, you know? And um, this is why people, they ruin marriages and why people... Uh, ruined good churches. You know, marketers have realized that consumers uh, no longer just want to buy a product, they want to buy an experience with that product. And so, and sometimes the emphasis on that more than the, 
product itself. You, you think about, um, what's the name of that? Main event, okay? Main event. And you know, the thing about main event, the, my kids asked me, do you, do you want to go to main event? I said, no. Well, they have pizza. I said, well, I'm sure it's not very good. I don't want to go. And I said, and besides, that's a bad name. I said, they should change it to, if this is the main event in your life, your life is sad, okay? But, but I, the only reason I would ever go there is to be a blessing to you. So I can't wait till you also hate it like I do. I, I would rather mow the grass, you know? But you know what people have done is, is they have uh, come to this thing where they, they want to turn church into an experience and they're more focused on that than the content. And uh, so uh, I got this thing and it says, how to create a better worship experience. And they say, energy, the same buzz and excitement that Jesus brought to every town he visited, we should try to reproduce in our services. Uh, greet people with hugs and high fives. Provide strong coffee so they're not falling asleep. Create a kids ministry that you have to drag the kids away from and use high energy music to set the mood for the day. The world has a way of beating people down through the week. Make sure your service lifts them up. You know, sometimes the energy that Jesus brought to the town was, Jesus, would you please leave? Jesus, come up here to this cliff. We have plans for you. We're going to throw you off. But look, uh, more, more important than your experience and my experience this morning is the content that we get from the Word of God. And if we're more focused on the spices in our life, then the, listen, life is not always spicy. But if you want to be a good Christian and a good servant of God, you have to keep eating the soup every day, whether it's really spicy or not. You just have to keep consuming that and eating it because it's of God and it's something that He gave you. And so we, we don't want to... There, I go past... Um, I take the kids to school sometimes in the morning and I, I pass this, this Lutheran church on Grissom Road and, and they just came out with this... There's a church sign and there's a big rainbow sign under it. You know? And that means we're open and affirming congregation. If you're a sodomite, you are welcome here. You know, we don't think there's anything wrong with what you're doing. We will applaud you for doing it. That's what that means, you know? And, and you, you read uh, Luther's writings, okay? And, and you know what Luther did? He condemned the Catholic Church and specifically the priests for their practice of sodomy. And now, the church that bears his name is promoting it. What happened? Something got into the soup that shouldn't be there. Because they were more ex worried about the experience that people had than the content. So they wanted people, when they walked in, to be comfortable and have a good experience. And so they sacrificed the content for the spices. And, and we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. And, um, you know, they, they took what was met for life and, and met it for death. And, you know, I have so much more here and I don't have uh, any more time, but the, the other thing they did is they incorporated what seemed good. Uh, he found a, a wild vine and gathered there of wild gourds in his lap and came shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew him not. You know, it looked like a good plant, but it wasn't. And um, what seems good is not always good. You know that? And uh, we, we say things sometimes that sound good, but they're not biblical, you know? And, and you know what? Those are their wild gourds. And when I first uh, came to the church and I was pastoring, uh, you know what I did? A lot of times I would grab wild gourds and put them into the to the soup, and 
And you know how we do that? We, we can have expectations of each other that are not biblical. They sound good, they look good, but they're not Bible. And so I had an expectation that you should, uh, uh, if you were right with God, you would go to every service. And I would say that, but that's not in the Bible. And I would say if you wanted to do that, you should read 10 pages of your Bible every day. That, that's not in the Bible, that's a wild gourd. I would say if you were right with God, you should only sing uh, songs that were written in the 1800s. And, and while they may be good, that's, that's not a biblical thing. It's a wild gourd. You see? And, and I'd say you have to dress a certain way and do this and do this. And, and you know what? Those were, those were wild gourds. They were expectations that looked good and sounded good, but they weren't biblical. And then on the other side, you have antinomianism where they say, now that Jesus died for us, we don't have to follow the moral law anymore, so do whatever you want. If you want to live with your girlfriend, that's fine. God doesn't care what you eat or drink or smoke. It doesn't matter. Well, that's a wild gourd too. And, and if we start incorporating things like that, we're going to ruin the soup because the Bible says there's a way which seemeth right to man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Then you have a, um, the last thing I'll say. I won't even go to the last point. But you say, you know, I, I understand all this stuff, and, and I've done that. I think we've all messed the soup up. Can we say that? I, I mean, I know I've messed the soup up. Okay? Uh, you say, well, well, what do we do about it? Well, look down to verse 40. They poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass that they were eating of the pot as they cried out and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof. You know, when, when we do that, the eating stops. When we poison the... People stop eating. They stop getting fed, you know? And we mess up all the good things that are already there. We, we taint all the good that's already there and ruin it, and make it all bad. That's what we do. And, and I've done that. I've done it to where people couldn't eat my soup. Because I put poison in it, and they didn't, they, they were, the poison is shred in there, so you can't, you can't tell what is poison and what is not. So you just say, I'm just not going to eat any of it, it's no good. And so what, what he says is, look at verse 41. And he said, bring meal and cast it in the pot. This, this flour. And he said, pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. Um, so here's what we do. We acknowledge that we messed up. We acknowledge that there is death in the pot and we've spoiled the food. The good thing that God has given for us. And, and we ruined it and, and we can't change the past. We can't take the poison out, it's all mixed in. But what we do is we cast meal into the pot. Now what is that? Well, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Didn't he? The words that I speak unto you, they're spirit and they're life, you know? And um, Jesus is the bread of life. And... Uh, it represents the Word of God. You're made clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was sitting there, and he said, bring meal, and, and then Elisha cast in some flour, I'd be like, well, it looks more like uh, dumplings now, but I'm still not eating it. <laughs> I'm not going to eat it. You know? Because flour doesn't take away poison unless something miraculous happens, you know? And uh, I, I wouldn't have ate, eaten it, but you know what you have to do? You have to eat it by faith. And, and you know what? I, I look at my soup and I say, man, I've messed this up so bad. Haven't you? Like I. But you know what Jesus said? He said, you know, if you, if you trust me, and if you allow these things to work in your life, you, for example, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I know you've messed it up and it's death, but if, if you trust the Savior, a miracle will take place. 
and that which was made death unto you can be made life. I know that you've messed everything up, but if you just put my word in there and apply it and just do what it says by faith, you see, the word of God is more powerful than the wild gourds. You know that? The word of God is more powerful than the wild gourds, and it can overcome and it can transform and it can neutralize that poison that's in your life. You you have to do it by faith. And the contrast is this guy brings these um, loaves to the other guy, and he said, and I'll have the piano player come out. Um, He brings the loaves to the um, people. And the the servant, Gehazi, said, this isn't enough food. And Elisha said, just give it to him. God said there will be plenty and it will be left over. Just just do it by faith. And and you know what? It, It turned out that way because he did it by faith. He just listened to God and followed and did it by faith. And uh, I don't know how bad the soup is messed up, okay? But I know that if we acknowledge that to God and we put Jesus in our life and the Word of God in our life, He can straighten that out. And then other people that used to not be able to eat can now eat again. Think about that. You know, there's people in my life they used to be able to eat my soup, okay? And I poisoned the soup so bad that they couldn't eat it anymore. But you know what God says? If you trust me and apply these principles, eventually some of those same people, you, you'll be able to feed them again, to be able to help them again. Isn't that a blessing? Man, God is good, and he'll take care of us if we apply these things. Now let's um, bow our heads and we'll pray, we'll sing a song, and then we'll have someone join the church. Lord, we come before you, Father. We are so thankful for your word. And Lord, I pray you help us all to amend our soup and our lives with the flour of the word of God and with Jesus, the bread of life. Lord, Lord, thank you for this example in scripture and this miracle that you performed. Thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.